the new Japanese policy. You see Japanese governments come and go at rather astonishing frequency. So what can we count on as far as this very ambitious new FIT? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll talk about a little bit about the Japanese feeding tariff. This feeding tariff, uh, we have started in this July. But uh, actually, the original plan was Japanese government wanted to start from April. But uh, due to the large earthquake last year we had, the Japanese government postponed to prepare food in tariff. And currently, we have two schemes. One is a smaller system, less than 10 kilowatt system. You can only sell for the surplus PV power uh, at the price of almost let's say 41 cent euro per kilowatt hour. And in case of the larger system, 10 kilowatt or more, uh, you can sell the PV power at the 39 euro cent kilowatt hour plus tax. And uh, maybe you think the quite generous tariff <laughs> compared to Jap Europe. But actually, Japanese PV system price is quite high. The last year, the average price is almost 4.7 euro per watt or 5 euro per watt. And uh, uh, as you may know, 80% of the Japanese PV system was residential PV system. So the commercial or utility scale market was not well cultivated. That's the reason Japanese government gave the uh, good feeding tariff. And uh, for stability, the Japanese government uh, set a law for the feeding tariff. The law stipulated the first three years would be the promotional period to expand the Japanese PV market. And uh, also uh, for residential, Japanese government uh, implemented the subsidy programs. And uh, the, we have the two incentives uh, for residential. One is feeding tariff and the other is subsidy. And uh, in general, uh, subsidy program, uh, budget, size of the budget, <laughs> define the size of the market. So maybe the two instruments, uh, we think one will work as a brake and one will be work as an axle. So uh, they, of course, we learned a lot about Europe. The Ministry of the Economy and Trade and Industry dispatched officials to learn about European feeding tariff to Germany, Spain, and other countries. So uh, I hope the our market will be stable. Of course, the experience in Europe has been that feed-in tariffs uh, are being rolled back in many places. Feed-in tar tariffs not always stable, of course. Um, again, the question for Japan, how deep is that commitment to renewable energy post Fukushima? Post Fukushima. Now, currently, the Japanese government is reviewing the basic energy master plan. The current master plan, this is established before Fukushima, that uh, planned uh, 14 new nuclear power plant. And uh, by 2030, the nuclear power should contribute 50% of the electric generation. But after Fukushima, uh, now it's very difficult. And actually, we have 50 nuclear power plant, only two power plant is in operation. Other power plants are under the examination or stress test. And, but we uh, achieved <laughs> somehow, uh, overcome this very hot summer. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, the recently the Japanese, uh, under the cabinet office, we have the Energy and Environmental Council, that they announced the strategy. The, this, phasing out the nuclear power plant in 2030s. The target year is not clear, and also the plan includes the increase the renewables triple compared to the 2010. And the new energy basic master plan will be formulated to consider the report issued by the Energy and the Environment Council. So I think now uh, Japan has a, a 
national target of the PB, uh, 20, uh, 28 gigawatt by 2020, and also 53 gigawatt by 2030, that this target will be included in the future. Asia Pacific, of course, expected to come up very strongly in the next five years. Um, Japan is one country that's uh, sometimes talked about as a potential number two, actually, uh, in future. India also, very strong potential, Chetan Sulanki. Tell us something, if you would, please, about India's uh, solar ambitions. We know they are encapsulated in the Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission. Give us a brief sense, if you would, please, of the main policy pillars <coughs> there. So this uh, India's National Solar Mission uh, has actually planned to, of course, install a lot of capacities of solar. Uh, the target is up to 20,000 megawatts of solar power to be installed by year 2022. And it is not only solar photovoltaic, but it is a mix of PV uh, plus thermal. Uh, but also considering the uh, situation, power situation in India, <coughs> where the grid does not you know, exist everywhere, or even if it exists, it's not powered every time. So. This installation is divided uh, into the grid-connected uh, power system as well as off-grid power system. And there is a significant component of off-grid power system uh, uh, to be installed as a part of this national solar mission. Uh, and there are like two uh, kinds of uh, incentives provided. Uh, one is uh, for the power system connected to the grid, you have the feed-in tariff uh, uh, plans. But the system which is not connected to the grid, the off-grid system, there is a uh, capital uh, subsidies that has been provided. So uh, this is one scenario where the central government is pushing the, the solar installation, uh, mainly happening in the photovoltaic. But other than that, uh, there are state governments also t making their own uh, policies and incentives to promote installation. And some of the states like uh, Gujarat has really taken a and a broad uh, leap forward and actually shown that uh, even at the state government uh, initiatives and a lot of installation can be done. And the whole thing has been planned, of course, uh, in, in our commitment towards uh, you know, climate change. Uh, but uh, in the whole scenario, the idea was also to you know, strengthen the manufacturing within the country. Uh, and uh, in this direction, for example, there are uh, restrictions that okay in the f and the whole mission is actually planned in three phases the phase one uh, which is ending in 2013 the phase two will end in 2017 and the final phase ending in 2022 uh, so in the first phase for example there is a restriction to uh, import crystalline silicon modules uh, from outside uh, thin film you are free to import because uh, that thin film manufacturing is not existent in the country uh, but there is also plan to uh, been, uh, put a restriction on the silicon solar cell itself until the second phase and maybe uh, in the third phase the silicon import itself may be uh, kind of restricted to within the local manufacturing. So with all this uh, uh, policy uh, in place, the idea was to promote manufacturing in the country to take care of the both off-grid as well as grid connected systems uh, and help Indian industry to, to grow up. Without getting too deep into the trade uh, issues there, but this buy local requirement as far as uh, silicon goes has had a very interesting effect on the distribution in terms of production technologies being used. As I understand, you have a much larger share of thin film uh, than most other countries. Right. So when the thin the film, not the one that is uh, connected. So when to the, the when the the, uh, the policy was planned, it was expected that it, most of it will be crystalline silicon, and uh, and that's why we left uh, the thin film uh, is open uh, to import. But because it's very price sensitive, and thin film modules are available at much much lower cost, and therefore most of the the power plant developers are now of course uh, going for the thin film technology and sourcing from outside. So in this way, it is not quite helping the Indian. Uh, manufacturing or the local manufacturing as a part of this policy. So just a little fact for us to bear in mind for panel two when we come back to trade mm -hmm. issues. Tamu, Asian companies are often perceived as the big winners in the solar game at the moment. We saw uh, a bit about that in uh, Stefan Novak's pre uh, presentation. The fact is though some of the biggest Chinese companies are facing mountains of debt they're even scaling back production at a time when really they should be scaling it up to realize economies of scale. 
What kind of policy measures is your association recommending in terms of ways to stabilize and grow the market? Okay, this is a good question and a big question. You know, uh, IPO, uh, we uh, just uh, established uh, last uh, October in Singapore, and uh, we uh, have already included, uh, you know, from Australia, China, uh, you know, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, um, seven uh, countries and areas. So, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Asia, we are from a uh, very north uh, fleet, uh, it's a very cold weather and, uh, you know, uh, and the, the south uh, is a, uh, a tropical zone. So uh, uh, for Apia, we very important is uh, how to, uh, to help to each other to uh, find out the, 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 the industry, uh, for example, the system standard to, to, to make sure uh, in, uh, you know, even cold, for, for example, in just for in Taiwan, we have very heavy typhoon and uh, earthquake, many uh, different uh, disasters. So uh, uh, we, we, we will find out uh, how to, uh, to, to, to make sure uh, to find out uh, uh, to, uh, to have a good industry standard to help to each other. So, so it's the, the, the number one. So and har uh, harmonization. Yeah, harmonize, uh, harmonize the, the, the standard, yeah. And the second is uh, because uh, uh, just like you say, uh, um, Asia uh, will be uh, growing very fast. And uh, so in IPO, we have a very important uh, mission is to